All righty, folks. Hemispheric reactions to the events in Europe and Asia. Now, this is happening in the 1920s, late 1920s, and early 19 to mid 1930s. Uh, this is during the Great Depression, where countries don't have a lot of money anyway. So, as a result of that, countries are focused on themselves. They're focused on the internal affairs that are happening within their own country, and they're not really looking for the issues that are going on abroad. Now, the Great Depression is going to lead to a rise in extremism, though. This is going to happen particularly in Asia and Europe. However, it is not only happening in Asia and Europe. Uh, there is going to be a rise of extremism really in every country um, because difficult times uh, call for great... Um, Great times call for great circumstances, kind of situation right through here. Uh, bad times call for some pretty bad circumstances. So uh, we have this really dark and depressing time, the Great Depression. No one's got a lot of money. Uh, that's why we're going to be turning to extremism. Uh, during this extremism, we're going to be focusing heavily on militarism, building up your military, getting that military ready to fight in war, and aggression. Um, kind of flexing your muscles a little bit. You've got this big military. Don't make me use it. I'm going to come over there. I'm going to punch you. Uh, and that's really what's going to be leading uh, to this ultimate rise in extremism um, and how it's going to be really showing its dirty, dirty face in public, so to speak. Now, the United States and Canada are going to try to stay out of the mix. Um, the Americas are going to be pretty isolationist during this time period. What's going on over in your neck of the woods in Europe, Asia? Uh, you guys handle your own stuff. We're going to continue to deal with our own stuff right through here. However, the United States and Canada are both getting drawn into the mix as a result of their relations with other countries. Uh, both the United States and Canada have a series of trade deals um, and economic really relationships with these other countries uh, and just diplomacy uh, with these other countries. So when they kind of start getting into the mix, the United States and Canada are also going to get drug in. Fifteen countries in the United or in the Americas are going to be a part of the League of Nations as well. Uh, the League of Nations, their primary goal is to focus on the international affairs of the world. So they're forced to look at what's going on and try to solve this, uh, solve the problems and fix this from getting worse. However, these League of Nations countries that are in the Americas also have to weigh the impact of their decisions on the United States. This is during the good neighbor policy. Uh, they're trying to increase their relationship and build a better relationship with the United States. And both countries, uh, both the American countries and the United States are benefiting from this. So it's something they really don't want to mess up and they don't want to make worse. So they have to make sure the decisions they make are going to be benefiting uh, the United States and not going to really anger the United States or they're endangering their newfound positive relationship with the United States of America. Now, if we keep going and looking at this, okay? Now, Japan is going to invade Manchuria. Now, there's going to be an explosion on a Japanese-controlled railroad, uh, and the Japanese are going to use this as a pretext for their invasion of the resource-rich Manchuria. So looking back a little bit in history, we get the Russo-Japanese War fought over the Korean Peninsula that ultimately the Japanese will win. Uh, the Japanese are going to be controlling and occupying the Korean Peninsula. Manchuria, we're right next to that. There's a Japanese-controlled railroad. It goes boom, um, and there's kind of a bit of a debate on what actually happened here. Just like when we're looking at the Spanish-American War, there's another kind of parallel in history uh, with the USS Maine exploding in Havana Harbor, leading the United States to invade Cuba uh, and start the Spanish-American War. This is going to be what's used to, for the Japanese to invade Manchuria. Now, uh, the United States is going to be one of the first nations to come out and say, yo, 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 Japan, back off. Uh, you can't be doing this. They're going to refuse to recognize Japanese control. So previously, we were talking about the policy um, of non-intervention and using diplomatic diplomatic non-recognition. This is an example of the United States using diplomatic non-recognition. Uh, it's like, hey, Japan, I know you're here, but you're not here legitimately. You shouldn't be here. You don't control this, okay? I'm not giving you the control. The United States is hoping that in doing this, it's going to force the Japanese to leave. It's going to put some pressure on the international community to do the same with Japan, and ultimately Japan's going to be kind of looking like the bad guy and have to back out. However, Japan's not going to do it. They're going to fail to leave. And this is going to bring us to the Lytton Commission. Now, the Lytton Commission is tasked with determining what caused this explosion. What happened? How did it go? And when doing so, they're going to determine whether or not Japan was guilty of aggression. If this was actually an attack, uh, Japan was justified in going in uh, to a certain extent to protect, their, uh, to protect their country and to protect their resources. However, if it was something that wasn't actually a physical attack, Japan's not a guilt or not really justified. It's considered an act of aggression. Now, the United States is going to appoint and send General Frank McCoy to serve on the commission. Now, this is going to be super interesting 
because this is a League of Nations uh, commission right through here. United States is well known for not being a member of the League of Nations. So the United States, uh, although they're not a part of the League of Nations, is working within the League of Nations to stop Japan um, and to make sure that this is looked into. Ultimately, Japan's going to be found guilty of aggression. Uh, they're going to be saying, yo, Japan, you should not have done this. But they don't really know what to do. It's like, cool, we figured this out. Now what do we do? I don't know. Do you have an idea? I don't know. And that's ultimately where it's going to stand. And it's going to be one of the major reasons why the League of Nations will fail is they're going to come up with these uh, policies and these decisions, but not really having any way of enforcing those policies or their decision. Now, at the same time, Hoover is president in the United States, and he uh, is afraid to put sanctions on Japan. Remember, sanctions are when you refuse to sell to a country, hurt them economically, uh, and hope that the economic pain is going to cause them to come around to do what you want. Now, Hoover feels that if he does this to the Japanese, it's going to lead to war. Uh, so Instead, he's going to put international pressure on Japan. Okay, let's get a lot of countries to put pressure on Japan, and hopefully that pressure is going to be enough to make them get out of Manchuria. The League of Nations is ultimately going to delay their decision until 1933 uh, for a number of reasons, just some little back count or background context on here as well. By 1933, Hoover is no longer president. We're going to get FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, in the United States. There's going to be a change of shift in the United States. Um, but number one, vast majority of the countries are unwilling to put sanctions on on Japan. Um, and the main reason they're unwilling to put sanctions on Japan is because the United States uh, is not going to do it and they're not a member of the League of Nations. So this could be problematic. Um, number two is they fear it's going to hurt the economic health of their country. This is in the middle of the Great Depression. Uh, these countries are already struggling economically. They're afraid that if they get involved and try to do these sanctions and have economic um, sanctions on Japan, it's going to hurt their own trade. Also, then the United States could swoop on in and start doing the free hand in Asia uh, and basically can start trading with Japan. And that was going to give them, uh, the United States, more power in Asia and really take away the League of Nations power in the region. Uh, so they're afraid of doing that. And number free, three, number three, uh, number three, they are afraid Japan is going to retaliate, which means war. Uh, and they're not really looking to fight a war right now. This is about 10 years uh, 10 to 15 years after uh, the end of World War One, they're really not ready to fight a war, uh, and they don't want to be starting a war. So they're not really going to do anything until about 1933. Now, Britain is afraid to speak publicly on their position. Uh, so what they're going to do is they're going to have Canada do it instead with the Secretary of State of Canada, Charles Cahan, right here. And now he uh, is going to state that he and that him, okay, the Canadians and the British, accept the Lytton Commission, okay, uh, yet in doing so, they're going to come across and sound pro-Japanese. Uh, so it's like, hey, Japan, we kind of support you, uh, but also you're guilty of aggression. Um, you can understand that this is going to be a bit of a conflict zone uh, for the rest of the countries in the world. Okay, um, Japan's not going to be happy because they're like, hey, you're saying we did this. Uh, but those who are opposed to Japan are not going to be happy because they're sounding pro-Japanese. Uh, so Canada and Britain are kind of in a rock and a hard place. Uh, it's going to show, though, that Canada is ultimately uh, torn between the United States and Canada um, because Canada needs both countries for their success, okay? Uh, Canada is basically the little brother of the British. Um, so they kind of want to stick with the British. They come from Britain, okay? They're a Commonwealth country. However, the United States is right there. Um, it's like their big next-door neighbor who's really good for trading, and you can make a lot of money. Uh, so you kind of have to stay between the two. So Canada is stuck between not literal rock and a hard place, but a rock and a hard place. Uh, so they're going to try to straddle the fence. But when you straddle the fence, you end up getting blisters. Uh, and that's ultimately what's going to happen here is Japan is going to, or not Japan, the Canadians are going to fail uh, to straddle the fence between both nations. They're going to try. It's not going to work out. Japan is ultimately going to withdraw from the League of Nations in March of 1933. And this is going to mark a shift in American foreign policy. Uh, basically, Japan's saying, like, cool, you don't like us here. You don't like what we're doing. We're just going to leave. They walked out the door. No one chased them. And that's going to be the end of Japan in the League of Nations. Now we got to look over at Germany. Okay, Germany, uh, in 1933, Hitler is going to be appointed Chancellor of Germany by President Paul von Hindenburg. Uh, and there's going to be a mixed reaction in the United States to uh, Hitler being appointed Chancellor. Uh, some kind of like what's happening, want to imitate his brand of nationalism. Um, they're going to be kind of thinking like, hey, this is kind of cool. Um, he's really increased the pride of the Germans. Germans are proud to be German. And that really wasn't the case 10 years previously after World War I. Um, they're like, this is cool. Maybe we can do the same thing. This is going to be particularly particularly uh, prevalent in, um, 
areas of the United States that have a large German immigrant population uh, and other countries like Argentina and Brazil that also have a large German immigrant population are going to kind of be on this side of um, this way of looking at Hitler's uh, appointment as Chancellor of Germany. Uh, others like President Roosevelt are going to be fearful of Hitler because they see his authoritarian policies and the harm that could come from them. Um, it's kind of like, yeah, we don't like what this guy's going. It's not going to be good. His policies are too crazy. Um, too authoritarian. This is going to be problematic. Others are kind of going to sit back and just wait and see what happens. They're going to look at Hitler um, and they're going to admire what he's done for Germany's economy. Okay, uh, this is again after the Treaty of Versailles, the disastrous economic policies, um, the hyperinflation in Germany, mixed with the Great Depression. Hitler comes around and really starts to stabilize Germany's economy um, in a very, very quick and efficient manner. And a lot of other people are looking at this and thinking this might not be too bad. However, they're also looking at some of the other stuff he's done, some of his more authoritarian policies and wondering maybe this is problematic uh, so they're gonna just kind of sit back give him a chance okay let's see what happens I'm not really supporting him but I'm also not totally in opposition to him let's just sit back let's see what happens uh, and that's really kind of what's gonna be happening for a lot of the world at this time period there's a lot of pressure uh, put on Congress to remain neutral stay out of the affairs of Asia stay out of the affairs of Europe we're going to worry just about what's happening in the Americas, okay? Uh, they can do their own thing. They can fight each other. We're going to stay here. As a result of this, okay, there's going to be a series of neutrality acts that are going to be passed. The first one's going to be passed in 1935, which simply states the United States is not going to sell arms, weapons, or war materials to any nation that is involved in a war. So if there is a war going on uh, between two countries, four countries, 12 countries, the United States is not going to trade weapons of war with those countries. It's going to ultimately expire but as I said before, be renewed in 1936, 1937, and 1939. The first time it's going to be invoked is with the Italian invasion of Ethiopia. Uh, during this time, the United States refuses to sell weapons and war materials to either Ethiopia or to Italy. Now, Canada is going to be divided on the issue of neutrality. Some Canadian politicians really want to step up and say something. Other Canadian politicians don't. So the Ottawa, uh, Ottawa, which is the capital of Canada, is going to inform the delegates of the League of Nations to abstain in condemnation. So do not condemn uh, what is happening uh, with the Italian invasion of Ethiopia. Don't condemn what Hitler is doing. Don't condemn these acts. Okay. The delegates are not happy with this at all because it's putting them uh, in the same camp with fascist Hungary and fascist Austria. Uh, they're not fascist. Okay. They don't like being grouped with the fascists. They don't want to go sit at the fascist table in the cafeteria. They want to sit in the anti-fascist table at the cafeteria. But the government's saying, don't do this. Okay. Just don't say anything. Don't make them mad. Uh, so they're going to work to determine determine sanctions against Ottawa's instructions. Uh, so basically, you're going to tell Ottawa, yeah, cool, we'll do what you say. And then once they leave, they're going to do the exact opposite because their own individual morals are going to kind of change what they're actually going to be doing. Now, the new prime minister is going to be elected in Canada in 1935. And right after his election, he's going to meet with President Roosevelt to determine the United States' position. What is the United States going to do on international affairs? What is the United States going to do with the continuing rising tensions in Europe and Asia? And what can we do uh, as a result of that right through there? Canada's League of Nations rep is going to urge sanctions. Okay, uh, The prime minister, King, is going to feel that sanctions are needed, uh, but they also need to be paired with demonstrations of strength. And this is yet another example of Canada getting blisters from sitting on the middle of the fence. Uh, they're stuck between the United Kingdom and the United States. Britain wants aggression. Be aggressive. Show what's happening here. The United States wants to restrained. Okay, say restrained. Step back. Make sure this doesn't get out of hand. Um, so by Canada saying we need to have sanctions, okay, but demonstration of strength. Sanctions, a little bit more restrained than going to war, but the demonstration of strength, usually demonstration of strength comes with military, a little bit more aggressive. So it's kind of the way of the Canadians uh, giving the British what they want while also giving the Americans what they want. Then we're going to get the Spanish Civil War. Now, most in the government are going to see the Spanish Civil War as a domestic issue. This is for the Spanish. The Spanish have to figure this out. We're not going to get involved in what's happening in Spain. We don't want them getting involved here. We're going to stay out of the picture. However, the vast majority of American businesses are going to support the nationalists, okay? Support Franco, who is a fascist and who ultimately is going to end up winning the Spanish Civil War and leading uh, Spain for a 
about 20 to 30 years. Uh, Texaco, the Texas oil company, is actually going to be supplying gas to Franco. Um, so even though the United States is officially neutral, there are individual companies within the United States who are willing to work with Franco and the nationalist. Mexico is going to be active in the war, okay? Another Spanish-speaking country. They're going to support the Republicans against Franco. So they're going to be going in opposition to like Texaco, uh, saying that Franco's wrong. We cannot support Frank Franco. Um, however, their impact is more of a morale booster than an actual resource. Okay, Mexico has been dealt a series of civil wars previously. Uh, they're really not all that uh, strong at this time period. They can't really be doing a lot when it comes to resources, but their morale is going to help the Republicans as they fight against Franco. Um, kind of like, hey, you got this, keep going, as you're continually getting punched in the face um, by the bully versus getting up and punching the bully to defend someone. The vast majority of Latin American countries are sympathetic with Franco and the nationalists. However, uh, they're officially going to remain neutral. And this is done to stay in line with the position of the United States. Remember, good neighbor policy is going on right now. Uh, they don't want to anger the United States. They're just going to say like, hey, we support you. We get what you're doing. But we're not going to actually do anything about that position because we don't want to tick off the United States of America. Then we're going to get conflict in Asia in 1937. And this time period, Roosevelt does not implement a neutrality stance because it is not an official war. So the Japanese and the Chinese nationalists okay, are engaged in a conflict of fighting. It's basically a war, but it's not considered an official war. Uh, so Roosevelt kind of finds the loophole in the neutrality acts and gets involved and supports the nationalist against Japan. Roosevelt is going to consistently seek to pass legislation to benefit the countries that he supports. So although the United States is officially neutral, although there's been a series of neutrality acts supported by Congress and passed by Congress into law that he ultimately signed, um, he is going to try to seek uh, to get legislation to pass that's going to help those countries that he views as needing the help. Um, this is going, uh, the United States is going to take a stronger stance against Germany than the United Kingdom will do. One of the reasons on this is that Canada is... Um, for a number of reasons, okay? So number one reason is Canada's stuck on what they need to be doing uh, because Canada, again, is kind of like the straddling the fence, okay? Do we do what the United Kingdom wants to stay a little bit more restrained versus the Germans or do we need to be more aggressive like Roosevelt and the Americans once? Uh, Roosevelt is going to go to Kingston, Ontario in 1938 and in this speech, he's going to give a speech there. He's going to state the United States is going to defend Canada in order to defend itself and that Canada is not a threat to the United States of America. It might be a threat to other countries, but to the United States, it is not a threat. If someone invades Canada, it's going to be seen as an act of aggression on the United States. We will step in and we will intervene. Canadian nationalists are worried about what this might mean. They feel that this might be used as an excuse by the United States to invade Canada and take it over. So if a country were to invade Canada, the United States military will waltz on in, defeat that country that invaded, and then just never leave. Others, though, are going to see this as an alliance opportunity between the United States and Canada, a chance for these two countries to work together for the mutual defense and benefit of both countries. Roosevelt is on the side of intervention, uh, although appeasement is prevalent throughout the rest of the world. So appeasement, when you're basically saying you can have this, just don't do anything else, versus intervention like let's get involved and stop this. I get to the Munich Conference of 1938. Uh, during the Munich Conference of 1938, they really uphold the policy of appeasement. Uh, all these world countries do. They're going to state, like, appeasement's what stopped a war from happening in Czechoslovakia. Therefore, it's clearly what we need to be doing. Um, again, Roosevelt is the odd duck out. He does not agree with this at all. Um, however, it's going to be kind of the prevalent policy throughout the world. Uh, Roosevelt then is going to send a telegram to Hitler, basically saying, don't mess with any other nations. Okay, you need to stop. We're done. We're done putting up with your crap. Hitler, being the masterful politician that he is, takes this note, reads it aloud, and tries attempts to embarrass FDR, making him seem silly and not serious. Uh, FDR is going to respond by going to Congress to try to get Congress to intervene to do something with Hitler, although it is ultimately going to be unsuccessful. Then, on September 1st, 1939, Poland is invaded by the Blitzkrieg, uh, and the World War uh, known as World War II, is going to be gun. Canada enters a war shortly after, being the only country in the Americas to get involved. The rest of the Americas are officially neutral. However, it is incredibly crystal clear that they are opposed to the Axis. So the Americans, okay, uh, the American countries, with the exception of Canada, although they're officially uh, neutral in policy, in ethics and morality, they are anything but neutral. They are opposed to the Axis. And we're going to get into that just a little bit more in the next couple of videos. If you have any questions, comments, put it down below. Otherwise, I will see you later. Good luck.